Well, we're totally blessed this morning. We've got we've got famous people with us this morning. We've got Brother David Benjamin. We've also got Dr. Alan Shore with us. Many of you know. Okay, that's enough. Many of you know. Many of you know Alan. He he does our Seder uh, dinner with us, and he's become a friend of Country Cowboy Church. So, while he's here, knock on his door as well. Amen. You know, I was reflecting on that song. I have nothing without you. And and do we really believe that? Because we do pretty good sometimes without God. We're we're pretty good at it until we've come to really recognize that it's all His, right? Even the clothes you're wearing right now, don't take them off. They belong to God. Amen? They belong to God. I I remembered the saying, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Have you heard that before? Do you know where that comes from? Job. Job where? The first part, Job 1.21. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's where that comes from. And I find that interesting that at that time, evil wasn't necessarily attributed to Satan. That God was responsible for everything. The good and the bad that came. It was attributed to God. But I see Job saying that naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But God did not take away, did He? Is it God that took from Job? Is it? Is it? No. Who who took? Who took? Satan took. Amen? Amen. He's the taker. God's the giver. Amen? I want to, you know, I just wanted to to look at that this morning and, and, uh, and let you know that it wasn't about Job's sin that these things were taken from him. That isn't it interesting, I see, that, that Job had a hedge of protection around him. Didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Satan said, hey, just remove that hedge and we'll see where this boy's at. Right? So isn't it interesting that even before Jesus came to this world, lived, died, rose again, that God hedged people in. With whomsoever loved, God protected. I find all that interesting. I find it very interesting. Accusing God of doing wrong is blasphemy. Are you ready to hear that? He allows it, but He does not do it. Interesting, I think. Interesting. I don't know about you, but when I start singing worship, stuff comes up. Stuff comes up. And if you've been in the Word of God, stuff is going to come up while you're worshiping. Things are going to pop in your head. And and that's one that did for me this morning. Now, if you take issue with anything I said, it's okay, study it out. You get to choose for yourself what you're going to believe. Um... The world is in turmoil. We're living in an upside-down cake. Sometimes I think, okay, I'm, I'm in the pineapple side. You know. But God is there. When I hit the bottom of my barrel, it wasn't empty. 
God was there. Amen? And He will continue to be so. I want to encourage any of you this morning, any of you that are struggling, any of you that are questioning, any of you that are troubled, sickness, disease, infirmities of all kinds, financial issues, woes of any kind, I want to assure you that God is with you this morning. That you are not an abandoned child. You are not an orphan child. You are owned by the Master of the universe. And you are His. He loves you. And He cares about you. He watches over you. And the good that is done is done by the hand of God. Amen? Um, Brother David is here with us. I know I shared a little bit last week about some of the uh, persecution that was taking place in India. Um, you know, Brother David is going to share with you a lot of things this morning. Uh, some of his testimony. Um, David, I just really thank you for being with us. You're a long way from home, brother. It's a long way from Chennai, India. And I appreciate that you took the time while you were here to stop by and see us and are for us your living sacrifice to be with us. Um, my family, I want to introduce to you Brother David Benjamin. David. morning. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and uh, I'm coming to the States after uh, more than two years. 2019 I came and, uh, and because of COVID I was not able to travel any, anywhere. And um, in 2022 God me, brought me here. And um, I was telling the other church that, uh, you know, in the last Two and a half years, I didn't have the opportunity to speak English. <laughs> uh, so I need your prayers today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm really thankful to God for this wonderful church and uh, uh, wonderful pastor. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to come and share my heart this morning. Um, uh, I have a word for you from from the Bible. And before that, uh, I brought some pictures from India. You know, uh, I wanted to show you, um, I told uh, the last two years we had this um, corona, and uh, uh, maybe you can start. Um, you know, we are working in the villages of India, and most of the villages, the people who are there, they, um, they are daily wage laborers. So if they go and work, they will get the money that evening, they will buy groceries, they will live. That's their lifestyle. And when Corona hit, uh, you know, what happened is they announced the lockdown in 2020 March and people were not having work. And that means they don't have money to buy anything and people were really suffering. And, uh, you know, and also the pastors there, uh, you know, um, they, the offering they get on Sundays is just merely enough for them to buy groceries for, till the next Sunday. And and all the churches were closed, and they were not also having any money and buy groceries or anything. And, you know, I was receiving phone calls like anything, Pastor, <laughs> we are going through a terrible time. And so we prayed for them, and God gave us a burden to help them. And we were also, at one point of time, you know, we don't know what to do. But really, God is good, and he was able to, you know, provide us with money, and we were able to go and, you know, uh, um, I'm not able to see the pictures. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I have some pictures that you know um, we were able to buy rice and other groceries um, uh, to the pastors and the village people. And you know, in the last two years um, we didn't do much of preaching ministry or something like that. But this is the ministry God gave us to visit these pastors and, you know, and, you know, uh, hand out rice and other groceries to them. Uh, I think the 
a lot of pictures you can just keep on going. <laughs> We were visiting different uh, pastors' fellowships and were able to give them stories. Uh, these are pictures from uh, um, these are blind brothers and sisters, and you know their life was almost stopped because of uh, uh, Corona, and we were able to go and you know give them groceries. And we went to different villages where we are working and uh, so there are many villages people uh, you know died not because of corona but because of starvation and when we heard about it you know really what gave this burden to go and visit them and help them in whatever way possible You know, um, there were a lot of travel restrictions. You cannot come out of the village. At, and also, they don't have work, they don't have money, and they don't have food. And, um, and uh, it was a big challenge for us also to go and visit these uh, places. Some places, the police stopped us. And, you know, in some places, you know, there were people who were so hungry or, you know, they just robbed us. <laughs> they took everything from us, and we wanted to go to another village, but we were stopped in the middle, and they took everything from us. And it was a really a chaotic situation. And and yeah. <laughs> the people who are living in the streets, and you know heard that the, in this region they are starving. So wherever we heard, got information, we were able to go and help those people. That's much better, you know, now they have some jobs, they can go and start working. And but uh, we had this lockdown in 2020 for about eight months, and then 21 for seven, six months. And those time, you know, a uh, lot of travel restrictions. You can travel only you have a um, pass. And they allow, they were giving pass only for uh, emergency and for um, uh, medical reasons or something. And others, they are not allowed to move anywhere. There were police stationed in every corner of the street, and they, you can't pass by them. Yeah, we applied and some places we get, some places we didn't get. And this is Pastor Stephen Raj and who helped us, uh, you know, in distributing uh, uh, rice and other groceries in a different region. And uh, uh, maybe you can continue. And, and he was very helpful. I used to transfer money into his account and he buy, he used to go to the shops and he used to buy and everything. But in the process, he was infected by COVID and he passed away. And uh, we passed, uh, we lost many pastors and friends and pastors' wives. Uh, and uh, in our region alone, Tamil Nadu, they say about 400 pastors died because of COVID. And um, yeah, these are some other pastors. thing is, uh, um, many of them are afraid to go out. You know, they will be infected and, you know, and, um, and only the Christians 
we're trying to help others yeah and and this year after this corona we had some meetings this one of the meetings we had a youth meeting uh, in south of chennai all the churches came together and uh, we were in, we invited 1000 kids 1000 young people but 2500 people came and you know um, young people came and they stayed for 3 days and uh, we organized only for places for 1000 people but so but <laughs> not able to do but you know this is a we called it as a fire camp we prayed for the holy spirit and most of them they received the power of the holy spirit uh, during this three day meetings yeah and then uh, i went to north in north part of india uh, after this corona two months ago in the month of june and we visited uh, different uh, cities and we had pastors meeting for leaders and pastors and these are some of the photos from different regions and in north india they made they brought new laws like if a hindu is present in a christian gathering then they can arrest the pastor or the person who is organizing the meeting because they are telling christians are gathering and inviting hindus to convert them so conversion is like a it's it's a very what is a negative word right now in india it's like a, con a conversion is like terrorism in their <laughs> in their years and so they have brought new laws and in, in one of our one of our believer they had a birthday party in their house and they invited five pastors and some neighbors who are hindus for the birthday party and suddenly the police came and arrested the pastors telling you have organized this meeting to convert people and so really these people we have to pray for this region and you know it's, that's what we are doing we invite people and pray for them but now they are telling you should not invite them and if you invite them you have to take risk <laughs> and uh, so it took us nearly 6 weeks to uh, get the pastors out from prison or the place where they are so yeah they really need prayers this is a uh, uh, last month we dedicated two churches and i have some pictures church buildings yeah Yeah, <laughs> to this year. <laughs> yeah, grace of God. <laughs> we can't allow fear to rule us. <laughs> yeah, this is my family. Um, yeah, my wife's name is Susan. I have two sons, Philip and Timothy. Philip is. 21 years and Timothy is 17 years. We can pray for our family. Thank you. <laughs> I also uh, really want to thank this wonderful church. You know, um, uh, Pastor was kind enough to send us some money to feed these people, and it was really a great help for us. And I want to thank Pastor and congregation for helping us yeah yeah um, this morning I want to share something that's in my heart um, you know in the last two years it was really a difficult time uh, uh, you know whenever uh, we hear that somebody is sick uh, you know we, we were praying for them and you know um, and some of the pastors, you know, the family, they called us and told the pastor is sick and he needs prayer and they, uh, he's, he's admitted in the hospital because of corona. And um, so we were thinking that, you know, because he's a pastor doing ministry and there will be a big vacuum if he dies, so God will certainly heal them. And so we were praying like anything, you know, with all faith and everything and we were fighting with, you know, God. Do a miracle, but 
sometimes God did not answer what you say. You know, we hear the news that they passed away. And it was a big shock for us. And, you know, this did not happen once or twice. You know, every week we were losing a couple of people. And, you know, and every time when we hear that we have to pray, pray for someone and, you know, we gather uh, as a family and we have these orphanage kids in our home and we all gathered and we were fight, praying like anything. Lord, we want to see a miracle. You know, I was able to see uh, if this pastor dies, you know, what will happen to the church or what will happen to his family. And all this burden was upon me and I was praying that God should do a miracle. But every time when we hear that, they passed away, and really my heart was broken. And at one point of time, my faith level dropped so to the bottom, you know, uh, uh, I, I even stopped praying. You know, because you are praying, and God has another plan we don't know, and God is not answering. And, you know, and uh, at one point of time, I thought maybe God is not at all listening to my prayer. <laughs> and, you know, so my Faith level was really uh, went to the bottom, and sometimes my wife, she wants me to come and pray with her, and I said, okay, you can pray, I don't want to, so I was neglecting prayer, and really, uh, um, you know, a lot of doubts came in my mind, like, is still God loves me? Is he still hearing my prayer? You know, uh, why these things are happening? And, you know, I just want to share this uh, morning with you how you know, God, through his word, how he um, brought me back to my feet. Or, you know, he uplift, you know, he, what to say, uh, really the word of God encouraged me to have faith in God more than ever before. This is what, oh, this is what I want to share with you. The Bible is a wonderful book. It's not only talking about the success, success stories. There were so many people who were disappointed with God. Am I right? You know, when, uh, when I read Ruth, um, chapter 1, 20 and 21, here we see Naomi telling, Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? Not only Naomi, we can see, uh, you know, Jonah, he was disappointed with God. He thought God will destroy Nineveh, but God did not answer his prayer or <laughs> his expectations were shattered by God. God forgave, forgave everyone. And he was disappointed with God. Mary and Martha, they were disappointed with God. They thought as soon as they passed the information that the brother, brother is sick, they thought Jesus will come running and do a miracle and heal him immediately. But it did not happen. So many people were disappointed with God. Today morning I want to share with you about a person called John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 11, I want to read from verse 2 to 6. John the Baptist was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? Jesus told them, Go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. Here we see John the Baptist, he is in prison. Some scholars say that he was in prison for more than a year. And he was hearing all, about all the miracles Jesus is performing. And he is also having an expectation that God will perform a miracle in his life. He wants to be set free from prison. Days went by, weeks went by, months went by, this miracle did not happen. And now, John is confused. 
and we see in this verse his john is sending his disciples to jesus and he's telling are you the messiah we been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else first of all we have to know who this john is john the baptist was the person who introduced jesus to the world is is the one who said here comes the you know son of god here comes the lamb who is going to take away the sins of the world is coming i want to read about the testimony john gives about jesus christ i want you to uh, turn to john chapter 1 I'd like to read from verse 29 onwards the next day he saw jesus coming towards him and said behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world this is he of whom i said after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me i myself did not know him but for this purpose i came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to israel and john bore witness i saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him i myself did not know him but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me he on whom you see the spirit descends and remains this is he who baptizes with the holy spirit and i have seen and have borne witness that this is the son of god john was testifying that he was telling to others that i am not the messiah he is the messiah he is the son of god and he was telling you know he is the one who is going to take away the sins of human mankind you know and his relationship with jesus was before he was born when he was in his mother's womb he knew who jesus was and you know and you know and and the bible says john came to this world to prepare a way for jesus and if you ask who's the person who know jesus very much is i would say john the baptist but now because John because Jesus did not fulfill his expectation now John comes to a place where he's filled with so much confusion and doubt and he's telling are you the one or should we have to look for someone else just imagine you know it's not only John or it's not only anybody else you know anybody from us we can have this doubt we are expecting something from god and we are praying and we are believing and we have all the faith and we expect god to do a miracle but when god did not you know uh he's is keeping quiet or he's having some other plan then we start to doubt am i right <laughs> and i think sometimes satan comes and use this opportunity and he wants to plant some more seeds of doubt in our mind maybe god is not loving us you know god is not caring about us and you know he's not hearing our prayers and all this doubt starts starts comes and you know occupies us and we, we we are confused and we don't know what to do sometimes what happen is even some good believers they go away from god because of this doubt they were expecting something from god and this did not happen and now they come to a conclusion i have nothing to do with god have we heard about those people <laughs> you know i can testify i know so many people they were praying for something and because god did not answer their prayers they stopped coming to the church and they don't want to do anything with god i was in a bible school and i i, I remember a person his name was freddy he was not in the bible school he was living near the bible school so whenever we have some uh prayer meeting on events he used to come there and he worship the lord he used to raise his hand and worship and you know as bible school students we were uh, envying him who oh, how much he loves the lord and everything but after after a few months suddenly freddy stopped coming to the bible school or any other events and uh, I was inquiring what happened to Freddy and nobody knows anything and one day I saw Freddy in a marketplace and I went and I saw him he was fully drunk 
and I wanted to talk with him and he was avoiding me. And then I took him and I said, no, tell me what's happening in your life and everything. And he said, David, I was praying for this and this and this. God did not answer. Now I have nothing to do with God. You know, sometimes when, when we are disappointed with God, we take this, I would like to say, stupid decision of going away from even in, in India, you know, when we pray for Hindus, uh, a miracle happens, then they accept the Lord and they start to come to the church. And, uh, you know, uh, at one point of time, they really love the Lord. They say, I'm, re I'm even ready to give my life to God. <laughs> but they were ex keep on, they will be, keep on expecting God to perform miracles in their life. But when, when a miracle is not happening in the life, then they are the ones who start to ask a lot of questions. And, you know, sometimes they stop coming to the church. They, they say, you know, we used to tell them, you look at God performed miracles in your life. And they, they, you know, they just forget about what God does in their life, God did in their life. And now they can't, when, just because they are not expecting an answer from God, they want to disconnect themselves from God. You know, I've seen many Christians, you know, just because God did not fulfill their expectation, they go away from God. But one thing I learned from the life of John is, even though he was disappointed with God, instead of going away from God, he's sending his disciples towards God. The best thing we can do when we are disappointed with God is, to seek God more, to come to His presence, you know, because if we are disconnect, if we disconnect ourselves from God, we are disconnecting ourselves from the source of the solution, the source of healing. And that's why I said the stupid thing we can go do is we can go away from God. But I really like what John did. He's sending his disciples towards God instead of going away from God. And the disciples are coming and, you know, and they are telling what John is telling. John wants to tell Jesus. The psalmists say, you know, uh, um, you know, pour out your heart. Trust in the Lord and pour out your heart. You know, there are some times in our life it looks that we can't trust God. Bible says that's the time we have to trust God and pour out our heart. We can even say, Lord, what's happening in my life? You can ask questions. I would, I would always used to say, you can ask God questions, but don't expect an answer. <laughs> so many times we ask, why, 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 why? You know, it's really interesting when John asked this question through his disciples to Jesus, and Jesus is answering. Jesus could have answered directly, yes or no. Are you the Messiah or not? He could have answered yes or no. But Jesus is something, sometimes he's, he, he tries to go behind <laughs> and answer. And what Jesus is answering is really interesting. I would like to, I used to say Jesus is like my wife. You can't understand. <laughs> Verse 5, it says, the Jesus is answering them, the blind see the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. This is the answer Jesus is giving. What Jesus actually is doing is, he quoting a messianic prophecy from the book of Isaiah. I want to read this two verses he's quoting, Isaiah 35, verse 1 and 2. Sorry, Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shouts for joy. And then Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. 
The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. This is the, these are the two Bible verses, a prophecy, a messianic prophecy. Jesus is quoting to John. He's telling the lame are able to walk, the dead are raised. The deaf can hear, the blind can see, and the good news is preached to the poor. I think when he, when he said this, Jesus believed that John the Baptist will understand what he wants to say. The question John the Baptist raises was, are you the Messiah or not? And Jesus is answering, I am the Messiah. Is telling because only the Messiah will bring healing, only the Messiah will raise the dead, only the Messiah will bring good news to the poor. But interestingly, Jesus is purposefully dropping one sentence from the prophecy. Are you able to identify? He's telling, he's not mentioning that prisoners will be set free. John the Baptist wants, he's having a need. He wants to he know whether Jesus is Messiah or not. And Jesus is telling, you have a need, I'm ready to answer your need. But you have a want that you want to be set free. And Jesus is indirectly telling, no. You know, sometimes we are not able to understand God. You know, God knows the big, full picture. We are not able to see. Maybe Jesus thought the purpose for which John the Baptist came to this world is fulfilled. He introduced Jesus to the world. He made the way for Jesus. And now it's time for John to receive the reward in heaven. In Isaiah 55, 8, it says, God is telling, my plans are not your plan. My ways are not your ways. My plan is much higher. Sometimes we are not able to understand certain things. But as believers, is because we are not able to understand God, are we going to go away from God or are we going to seek Him more? And God is always there to answer our need, but God is not ready to answer our wants. Sometimes we have to leave it into God's hand. And Jesus is telling to John, I am the Messiah, but you are not going to be free. But he's not ending there. The next verse is very important. He's saying, verse 6. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. He's telling John, even though if I'm not going to answer your prayers, if you are not, go away from me, you are a blessed person. Many times, you know, if God is not answering our prayers, you know, we are disappointed with God and we take hasty decisions of going away from God. I think you are missing something. As believers, as people of God, one thing we have to learn that, you know, our God is a good God. Though we are not able to see the full picture, we have to trust Him. And we have to continue our relationship with Him. And that is the biggest blessing. The biggest blessing for John is not that he's going to be out of prison. The biggest blessing for John is nothing is going to stop him to continue his relationship with God. 
And I believe that should be our big, biggest blessing. Nothing should stop us from trusting God. Nothing should stop us from having this intimate relationship with God. You know, the word Christian comes in the Bible just three times. But the word disciple occurs more than 297 times. And you know, my definition of a Christian and a disciple is, a Christian is someone who focuses on things, what he can get from God. God, I want healing. God, I want this problem to be solved. God, God. And he thinks he is in the middle and God, is, God exists just only for him. But a disciple is a person who focuses on things that what God is expecting from him or a person who is more concerned about the purpose of God. You know, 100 years ago, people were thinking, you know, the sun, the earth is in the middle and the sun is revolving around the earth. Still some Christians are thinking like that. They are in the middle and God exists only for them to answer their prayer and keep them safe and comfortable. A disciple will understand where is his position. He knows that God is in the middle. You know, God, he not only created us, he paid a price for us and he has bought us and we belong to him and we are here to fulfill his purpose and his plan. You know, when we look at the, uh, look at the different, uh, the, the missionary, lives of many missionaries, you know, it's really uh, questionable. They were working for the Lord, but at the early ages, sometimes they have to die because of sickness or because of persecution. I would have thought maybe if they lived longer, maybe they could have achieved more for God. But we don't know. God has, God's plan is totally different than our plan. You know, uh, two weeks ago, I, I, I was in uh, Ventura, and the pastor was taking to me to uh, an old age home. And there were so many old people. I never seen people so old, like 98, 99, 102, 104. When I saw them, I was <laughs> really surprised. And, you know, and they all came for prayer, and we were talking about God and the prayer, and everyone came to us for prayers, and each one of them were telling about uh, something is wrong with them, and they want healing, and they want prayers, and we prayed for them. But after some time, I start to realize nobody wants to die. Even though if they're 102 or 104, they still want healing and they want to live. <laughs> then God was speaking to me something, you know, why people are afraid of death is somewhere in the heart they know they have not fulfilled the purpose of God. Jesus, he died when he was 33 years old. But he was able to say, it is finished. God had a plan for Jesus and he was able to come and fulfill the purpose of God. And he was not afraid of death. Paul, they say, he died in his 50s. But he always said, death is my gain. He was never afraid of death. He said, I would like to be with him. I want to be absent here. I want to be present with him. Because he was able to say, I have fought a good fight and I finished the race. I think the people who know the purpose of God and who are able to fulfill the purpose of God, I know they will, won't be afraid of anything in this world. So many times, you know, they are not 
I would like to say we are not sometimes bothered about the purpose of God for our life. We are much concerned about our daily routine and our daily commitments and our daily life. And we are so much focused on these things. Sometimes we are not bothered about the plan of God for our life. Yeah, this morning I would like to encourage you, you know, the meaningful life is to know the purpose of God and fulfill the purpose. Nothing better than that. You know, when you see the life of so many missionaries, they know when they go to that particular place, they are going to die, but still they were ready to go. Because for them, fulfilling the purpose of God is very, very important. I heard a story, you know, those days when they were sending missionaries from mission organization from England to Africa, the mission organization used to encourage them to take their own coffin box instead of a suitcase. Because coffin box are not available in those countries. They said, don't take your suitcase, put your clothes and everything in your coffin box and travel in your ship, take it there. And you know, when you, when you, when the thing is finished, you have your coffin box. You know, as believers, you know, God has a calling for us. God has a purpose for us. And as believers, our focus should be, Lord, what is the purpose? Why you have created me? Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 1.4, Before I was formed in my mother's womb, you know me. He not only knows me, in the next verse he says, I have called you to be the prophet to the nations. So God not only knew us, but he also has a purpose for our life. Paul says, before I was formed in my mother's womb, I know you have called me to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So every one of us, God has a purpose. God has a plan for our life. And the meaningful life is to know the will of God, to know the purpose of God, spend time at the feet of God, and know the purpose and fulfill the purpose of God in our life. I think nothing better than that. You know, when we are living in the purpose of God, we won't complain why God is not answering our prayers. Many times we focus on why God is not answering. Let me tell you one, th one more thing about God. God will never try to explain you. Because in my life, I've asked so many whys, still I've not <laughs> received any answer from God. <laughs> when you read the book of Job, Job went to such turmoil and you know, such tragedy took place in his life. Everything he en endured and he went through. But you can read the whole book. God never explained to Job why this is happening to him. At least. We know why things went wrong in the life of Job. You know, because it is written, we are able to read the conversation between God and the devil, and you know, everything happened. But Job, he has no clue why he lost his children, why he lost everything. And God did not bother to explain everything to him. This is our God. And we as human beings, we always want God to answer our prayers and do perform miracles and miracles after miracles after miracles. Yeah, of course, God does miracle in our life. You know, I was sharing with Pastor, I was also affected by COVID. And, uh, you know, I was really serious. I was admitted in the hospital. My, my oxygen level went to 60 and, you know, and two days later, my wife was admitted, and two days later, my son was admitted, and a week later, my father was admitted. And, it, you know, but many people prayed for us, and, you know, because of the prayer, I'm alive today. And God extended my life, and, you know, maybe he's a, having a plan and purpose for my life, and that's why he extended my life. And, you know, 
even though i experienced a miracle in my life when the next time when god is not answering i am disappointed with god when you read john chapter 6 i think it's a big chapter maybe you can go home and read jesus is performing this miracle he is feeding 5000 people with five loaves of bread and then the next miracle he's doing is he's walking on the waters and then he's going to the other side of the shore and the people are coming there and you know they are talking having a conversation teaching god is teaching them he's telling them you are here not because of me but because of the food i gave you and all these things and then he's and the people are asking him what should we have to do and jesus is telling believe in me do you know what they answered when i saw when i read this i was shocked they said we have to believe you show us a sign just now he performed this miracle of feeding 5000 people 5000 people then he was walking on the water and now they want a sign <laughs> this is who we are we expect god to perform miracle after miracle after miracle when is not showing up then we doubt him and we say you are not loving me you are not bothered about me and all these things come and bother us <laughs> and that's why i say no god is not ready to answer every one of our questions all we have to do is trust him so the question this morning is are we ready to trust god even though if you are not able to understand him proverbs 3:5 says trust in the lord and do not lean on your own understanding yeah thank you very much this is what i had in my heart to share with you this morning thank you for this opportunity Oh my goodness. Isn't it wonderful with the dark skin how bright your smile is? <laughs> and David can challenge you and you go, "Ooh." And then he just smiles. <laughs> like there it is, figured out for yourself. What a good word. We we i can't say we me i'm like that you know when when i feel as though god isn't giving what i what i feel i need it is easy to be disappointed I can remember and I've told this story before I I can remember when I was a pastor for um like over 5 years long time and I quit I got mad because I couldn't see the hand of God working in in our fellowship we were just down the street here and I got mad and I started crying my heart was so broken and i started taking everything i went and got a cardboard box and i'm putting everything in the box pull picture down i put everything goes in the box and i'm just crying and i heard the voice of god so where are you going and i said i don't know it's so what's what's wrong i'm tired of trying to teach the saints for the prepare the saints for the work of the ministry when they have no desire for ministry he said yeah me too
hasn't stopped me. Put everything back on your desk. We're not done here. So, don't get mad at God. Put everything in a box and try to quit. Because He's got a plan. Because He's got a plan. And though we can't see it, though we can't imagine it, though we can't understand it, when we look behind the lives that we've lived, can we not see the direction that disappointments, struggles, battles, can we not see what those things have accomplished to bring us to the place we are today? And yet remember that when those disappointments were happening, when those struggles, when we were in the midst of those struggles, can we remember how ready we were to say, I'm, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Maybe that wasn't you. Praise God, if it wasn't. But I so appreciate this man. And he's going to be hanging around here for a little bit after church. Um, if you want to love on him, give him some sugar, I'm sure he'll take it. And if you have any questions or he said anything that challenged you and you want a little more clarity on, pin him to the wall. Drive him in a corner and work him over. Like Muhammad Ali would do. And, and challenge him back. Say, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What about... I don't understand. There, there he is right there. The horse is here. You can talk to the horse and get the answers you need. Maybe. Father, we thank You in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We thank You for the, the challenges, Lord. The purpose that You've given. We thank You for our brother David who has so graciously offered himself to us today. And the Word that You've given him. Father, may it, may it leave a lasting impression on our hearts as, as we now remember once again that You are the God of the universe. You are not, Father, You are not some cosmic slot machine that we put our prayers into like quarters and crank the handle waiting for waiting for three pineapples and a bell to ring. Help us, Father, to be mindful of who we are. Who we are really. And who you are really. We will give you thanks. We will give you praise that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen? Give somebody some sugar before you get out of here. Yes? God bless you, everyone. And don't forget, He's right here. Amen.